Jim, I appreciate you reading that from Isaiah 52 and 53. The prophecy of the suffering servant was what Jim just read. That was given 750 years before Christ was born. For a prophecy, 750 years to say, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, upon him the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. It's quite an amazing prophecy to think that that would be fulfilled in Jesus. And I wonder whether the authorities that were there to see him crucified actually realized prophecy being fulfilled as it was. I don't know that I've ever preached one message and claimed that it had a theme. However, this lesson today has one. Christ Jesus made many proclamations about who He was during His ministry. And this last Friday night at the uh, Good Friday service, uh, the Ministerial Alliance, we preachers presented a message of the Gospel through the I Am statements. And Jesus used the I Am statements to proclaim His deity, to say that I am God. Throughout His ministry, Jesus made clarification to Old Testament prophecy and Scripture. The Pharisees and scribes had so distorted God's law and placed a burden of tradition and ritual on the nation of Israel that Jesus proclaimed their religious leaders had made the Jews and their converts twice the sons of hell that they were. He said that those so-called Jewish leaders were whitewashed tombs and He labeled them together as a brood of vipers. They hated Him. They truly hated Him. If the declaration of deity by Jesus and the attacks on the scribes and the Pharisees weren't enough to question Jesus' wisdom and authority, then surely the prophecy of proclamation over death would have all but made Jesus a first century lunatic. Perhaps it would have even made Him an agent of Satan that the scribes and the Pharisees claimed Him to be. But what if He was all that He proclaimed to be? That is, God in the flesh. What if he really understood Scripture as an author understands his own written word? The temple. What if Jesus could have the temple destroyed and raise it up in three days? Would anyone, would anyone even understood what that meant? Well, there were those who clearly, clearly understood the implications of Jesus fulfilling His own prophecy. But it might not be the group of people that we would expect to have believed. Surely those twelve men who ministered with Him throughout Palestine would know exactly what Jesus was proclaiming about Himself. Not so fast. Let's take a look and see. We studied a while back in John chapter 2, the first cleansing of the temple in Jerusalem. It is from John chapter 2, starting in verse 13, we will read this morning, where Jesus initially utters this prophecy Destroy this temple, and three days I will raise it up. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a cord of whips, he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out of the coins the money changers and turned their tables. And, and he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal, for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, this would have been the scribes and the Pharisees. What sign do you show us for doing these things? And basically they're saying, why do you have the authority to do this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. 
And the Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the day dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now we're going to fast forward to Passion Week. Jesus has been in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. They've already had the Last Supper. Jesus is arrested. And he is brought before the Sanhedrin, that 72 member council of the Jews, made up of Sadducees and Pharisees, whom the high priest Caiaphas was the leader. In Mark chapter 14, verse 55, we're going to read through 65. <clears throat> now, the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death but they found none. They couldn't find any testimony. For many bore false witness against them, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against Him, saying, We heard Him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Jesus' own witnesses against Him proclaimed the prophecy that Jesus had declared Himself. Yet even about their testimony, they did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is this that these men testify against you? But He remained silent and made no answer. Remember what Jim read? He was silent. No deceit came out of His mouth. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. I am. I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And with, the high, and with this, the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit upon him and cover his face and strike him, saying, Prophecy. And the guards received him with blows. So Jesus has appeared before Pilate at this point. Pilate has declared him innocent. He couldn't find any guilt in him. Pilate symbolically took his hands and washed his hands, showing the Jews that he declared himself innocent of Jesus' blood. But nonetheless, Pilate acquiesced and allowed them to crucify Jesus by his command. And so in Mark 15, now, we are at the crucifixion. The crucifixion where many of the Jewish leaders have come to gloat. Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 22. And they brought him to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. They offered that to him because it was a numbing agent, a painkiller. And they crucified him. And they divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide which should take each. Again, from Isaiah. And it was the third hour when they crucified Him. And the inscription of the charge against Him read, the King of the Jews. And with Him they crucified two robbers, one on His right and one on His left. And those who passed by Him derided Him, waging their heads and saying, here's His own accusers, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. 
those who were crucified with him also reviled him. Now moving forward or back in your Bible to Matthew chapter 27, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus have come and taken Jesus' body down from the cross. They've taken it down from the cross and as written in Isaiah, Jesus is buried in a rich man's tomb along with the wicked. But a rich man's tomb, Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man. <clears throat> when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea. This is in verse 57 of Matthew 27. Named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate ordered it be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut into rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is the day of preparation, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees again gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. You see, there was a group of people who understood exactly what Jesus was proclaiming. They knew it wasn't the temple. Therefore, they asked Pilate, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. And so they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. The seal was a great seal made out of melted wax with Pilate's signature in it. And the guard was a Roman guard, not a Jewish guard, standing there. Now, flipping over to Luke chapter 24, we're going to read an account of the resurrection. And yet, once again, we're going to hear testimony, not from Jesus himself, but from agents from God. Again, helping us understand that Jesus truly professed what would happen to him after he died. Luke chapter 24, verse 1. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But they went in, and they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in a dazzling apparel. As they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said, Why do you seek the living among the dead. He is not here, but has risen. Remember how He told you while He was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of the sinful men and be crucified and rise on the third day? And they remembered His words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw linen cloths by themselves and he went home marveling at what had happened. Now there's another account of this in John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and that is John himself. So this is first-hand testimony. And said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid Him. 
So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw linen cloths lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came in following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by himself. Then the other disciple, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. He saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Okay, now I know that was a lot of scripture. But it's important to take scripture and make our case. We notice that in John chapter 2 in the very beginning. That Jesus make it, makes a declaration of rising in three days. Those that were asking for a sign seemingly dismiss his declaration by observing his statement as a destruction of the Herodian temple that has taken 46 years to build. Now in all actuality, it was done even after Jesus was crucified. It took a total of 64 years to build that temple. But maybe, just maybe, the Jewish leaders reflected upon this declaration and understood it as Jesus prophesying. We do, however, notice that at some point the Jewish leaders have changed their mind and perception about Jesus and what He declared. They have obviously understood the prophetic nature of Jesus' statement of rising in three days. By their own testimony in the court of the Sanhedrin, by their own testimony before the crowd at Golgotha, and by their own testimony to Pilate in request of a Roman guard to guard the tomb, we have the admission of Jesus' enemies of His actual declaration, not to mention the fact that He is truly dead, which some would like to argue against. Jesus' own enemies identified with His proclamation and they identified with the fact that He had been crucified and was dead and lying in a tomb. More than that, we have proof that Jesus' enemies have taken the ramification of Jesus' prophetic claim seriously, even if they believe that it's a hoax or that there will be a hoax. However, they have seen with their own eyes the power of Jesus. Remember, just in the week before the Passion Week, Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead after three days in the tomb. Raised him on the fourth day. And that's very significant because the Jews believe that after three days, the Spirit actually left the body forever. And He raised Lazarus from the tomb. And we read later that Lazarus was present with him in their home and ate at the table. John recalls in his testimony of the resurrection that the other disciple believed. He's talking about himself. But, but what did he and Peter not yet understand that Jesus must be resurrected? What was it that John did believe? I think he believed that Jesus had conquered death, but he had not necessarily understood a physical, bodily resurrection. Okay, I don't think that had come to his mind. Luke's testimony of the women reports to the disciples that the body was taken, but the disciples took their testimony as idle fairy tales. A woman's testimony was no good in first century Palestine. What changed their mind? Here they had these women coming in and saying the body's gone. But he appeared to us. And they thought, you're crazy. What changed their mind that they believed? Well, we know. Seeing is believing. John and Peter went to the tomb. Peter was amazed. 
John said he believed. We know that Jesus appeared to them many times in resurrected form. He ate with them. He continued to teach them things of revelatory nature that would now make sense to them because they remembered what He said He would do. And then He ascended in their very presence into heaven. I want to close this morning's lesson with a couple of more scriptures. Seeing is believing. Eight days later, in John 20, His disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. This is one of the times that Jesus appears to the disciples. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Thomas wasn't there the first time that Jesus appeared to the disciples. So Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. In Romans chapter 10, the Apostle Paul tells us, starting in verse 9, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. That word justified, that means you are pronounced not guilty. To be justified is to have your guilt taken away all at once by God's mighty pronouncement. You are pronounced justified. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here's where we come in. How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in, who, in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have, not all, they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? And Paul closes his statement by saying, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. You have heard the word of Christ this morning. Jesus professed, that you destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Either that is true, or he is a liar, and we are all deceived and lost in our sins. Those are not my words, those are your Apostle Paul's words. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Have no doubt. As Jesus himself encouraged Thomas, I encourage you this morning. Don't disbelieve, but believe. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I know most of you already believe this and are attentive to your faith. I have confidence in that. So I challenge you as well with this. Don't keep the good news to yourself. You have one purpose in this life, and it is not your own. It is God's, whether you like it or not. You were created to bring Him praise, honor, and glory and to spread the good news. You weren't created to get up in the morning and go make a living, although that's part of it. 
That is the economy of this dispensation that we live in. But don't keep the good news to yourself. There is nothing greater that you can do for another person than share your personal testimony. Share it with someone who does not know Jesus Christ. After that, God will do the work on their heart, but they must first be confronted with the truth of the gospel. How will they believe if no one preaches to them? Now that doesn't mean you drag them in the door and they hear me preach. They don't know me. They know you. However, if you do not until today have faith in the Lord, Christ Jesus, and you would like to publicly, publicly confess your faith in Him by repeating the good confession with me and being immersed into Christ today, I invite you to take the opportunity to do that. Come forward. Make your faith known. That's what we're to do. Come forward and start living an eternal life now. Instead of praying this morning, I would like for you to stand with me and grab your hymnal. Turn it to hymn number 605. 605. We're going to sing the first and last verse of 605. If you would have a decision for the Lord this morning, we invite you to come. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come,